Good afternoon. Welcome to the Critical Issues of Contemporary China Seminar Series at the Fairbank Center for Chinese Studies at Harvard University. Um, as all of you know, this series was started by Professor Ezra Vogel, and um, unfortunately, he passed away at the end of last year, but um, the series continue with the spirit that Ezra has started. Today, I am very unwinning yip and last year I was the acting director and uh, I'm very glad to be back here today to welcome um, Professor Scott Rizal. Scott is a development economist whom I admire and aspire to become when I was in graduate school. And I also have had the opportunity to work with Scott uh, briefly um, about 10 years ago. I would say that Scott has devoted his life to improving um, rural conditions in China through his very rigorous research in agriculture policy, in education, in poverty, inequality, health and nutrition. Over the last several decades, he has built a big team of researchers in China. Not only is his research impactful, but he has also made such a big difference in building up the whole field of development economics in China. And if you visit him, especially in China, seeing the work and the group of people who work with and aspire, inspired by him, it is very heartwarming. And I would say that Scott also has a special, special um, relationship to the poor regions in China, especially places like Gansu, like Guizhou and that. And so today we're very delighted to have Scott to come and talk about his research, which is embodied in his book, Invisible China. So over to you, Scott. Uh, thank you, Winnie. And, uh... Uh, it's very nice to, to be able to, to come to the Fairbank Center again. I, I wish I was actually there, <laughs> as we all do. But uh, uh, this is, uh, you know, my my pleasure to to come here. And uh, um, yeah, really, um, in the past, uh, I haven't changed the title of my my PowerPoint since when we started talking about this. Uh, it, it was a book talk, but it's really become. Uh, sort of a statement on, um, how would we say this, on common prosperity, right? Uh, the, the new big policy of, uh, of the, the Chinese government and party to um, let's end. Um, what I try to say in my response to what do you think about common prosperity is, you know, I think number one, <laughs> uh, number one, you have to keep prospering, right? I, uh, China uh, is may have the second largest economy in the world, right? But it's seventieth in per capita, you know, income. Uh, it is clearly, you know, in the middle income uh, area. So uh, uh, it, it has a long way to to go before ever, before they're at a, at a level that the whole economy is prospering. Of course, then once they prosper, they need to prosper commonly. Uh, and then that's the other part of this is, will people be able to um, uh, join into this uh, high income, high skill, high technology economy that uh, the Chinese government wants that, I mean, that, you know, basically that I want, <laughs> I hope uh, happens. Um, and uh, uh, so th that's really, you know, what's behind it. And I'll talk a little more about that later. And um, just along those lines, um, this isn't a China bashing book. <laughs> uh, like like Winnie said, I have lots of friends in rural China. I've been working there for almost, almost 40 years. Um, and if, what's good for China, if China's economy goes, our economy uh, benefits, uh, the world economy benefits. And uh, if China's economy doesn't thrive, there's some problems I think that might happen, and we can talk a little about those. But that's uh, those issues are a little beyond <laughs> that of, of a development economist that squats in villages and does interviews. That, uh, uh, but so th that's sort of the background of the book. Um, um, 
And I don't need to say this to the Fairbank Center people, right? Uh, uh, rural China is, invisible China is rural China, right? Uh, 840 million rural have people have rural huko. That's one ninth, one tenth of the world's population. And, you know, you know who they are. They're the workers. They're the self-employed uh, uh, gig economy workers. OK, I, I'm going to come back to these guys. Uh, um, they, they're they becoming more important than these factory workers and construction site workers. Um, and you're, we're going to talk about that and what that means and why, perhaps. Uh, um, and that, of course, rural China is the elderly and the left behind children and the families that are crowded into the migrant communities uh, in the alleyways of, of the big cities. Um, also, probably most people here don't, don't need to know when when I first started working in China, 85 percent of the of of Chinese lived in rural communities. Almost everyone had a family there. And so people are going back and forth, you know, college students, professionals, government officials came from these farming communities. Uh, when you went across the country, <laughs> uh, you know, you stopped in uh, small village guest houses and ate in village uh, farm uh, restaurants. And so it wasn't invisible. I mean, people knew what was going on then, but now we fly over the top, right? Or uh, I'm a... <laughs> I'm a very bad photographer, but I love to take photos and sort of remind myself and share and, uh, you know, my WeChat moments and <laughs> everything like that. Uh, but, you know, you can't even take a picture of a village going 350 kilometers an hour. It just blurs. Um, so so they've, they've lost that connection. Um, and, you know, through the media and through where people live, we think China we know this China, right? We know that China very, very well, uh, but we don't know this one. And so that's sort of the reason. And then I try to take a development economist view and say, you know, what's happening there and why might that hurt, you know, um, uh, Ch China's rise? So that's kind of where, oops, kind of where we're going. Here we go. Um, um, I, 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 let me go over this really quickly. Um, you know, I've, um, the book is based on lots and lots of field work. I've visited more than 650 counties and I was adding them up. <laughs> Somebody asked me for a podcast last year. I've probably done more than, uh, you know, a million surveys, right. Um, over the last 30 years, uh, of course, uh, uh, you know, this is me doing the surveys. I just go into the village and uh, manage the team. That was me in 1988. I'm doing my PhD dissertation then, right? Uh, and here's me today. I'm still going. And uh, same kids, uh, different setting, right? But of course, I don't, I do zero of the interviews, actually, as um, we basically collaborate with uh, local college professors, university professors, sometimes they're my students, uh, oftentimes they're visiting scholars, colleagues I've worked with for 10, 20 years, and um, their students are the ones that do the surveys, implement the projects, and then uh, do the do the evaluation surveys. Um, and uh, the great thing about Chinese colleges is it's, the bad thing is it's really, really hard to get in, but once you're in, you can't fail. So we can we can give these guys a, a, a two week vacation um, uh, sitting in villages and doing interviews. So uh, that's sort of where my where my work comes from. Just thought I'd share that real quick. So how does invisible China threatens China rise? OK, um, this is a graph. This is a very important graph. Uh, and uh, um, just go quickly over it. Here's income today and here's income 60, 70 years ago. Okay. 60 years ago. Uh, and then these countries down here, right? Um, Myanmar, Congo, right? They're poor, poor. Okay. That they're, 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 that they've been poor this whole time. Uh, the, the countries up here, of course, are the OECD countries, the, the rich countries, the U S Norway, Switzerland, Australia, Okay, that they've been rich 60 years ago and they're rich today. Uh, I'm interested in, in two sets of countries. First of all, the graduates, okay? These are the countries that over the past 60 years went from middle income to high income. And I want you to notice two things, okay? First, there's not very many of them. 
um, I, I, I want to say on the side is you notice Eastern European countries aren't in there. That's because they used to be high income. <laughs> then, then they joined the Soviet Union, became middle income. And then now they're back. Once they joined the EU, they're back to high income. So, so they're, they're not included in on this graph. But you can see there's only 15 countries in the last 60 years that have moved to high income from middle income, um, Israel, Ireland, right, uh, South Korea, uh, countries and territories, Taiwan, Hong Kong, okay, um, and uh, it's a very, very small group, and no country has has graduated in the past 20 years. Uh, South Korea is the last one to graduate. The, here's Brazil, you know, it almost got there, and then about five years ago, came right back down. Um, of course, most of the countries in the world are in the middle income trap, okay? They were middle income 60 years ago. They grow, grow like that, right? And and when they go like that, you know, it's not, they aren't in this equilibrium like uh, uh, where everybody's happy. We're happy at middle income. I mean, there's lots of people get hurt and lots of people are, are um, you know, it's a it, it's a tough, um, tough life for many in those economies in those time periods when stagnation or collapse happens. We don't even feel them in the U.S. because so many of the countries are so small, but um, it, it's a big deal. So, so of course, what I'm interested in is why could some countries do that while most of the countries stay down there? Why can't they go up there, right? Um, and one of the big differences, there, there are others, but at the time of middle income, so we're talking about these countries at the time of middle income, uh, the entire level of their human capital um, is already high, okay? So, uh, and when I say their, their levels of education, I'm using an OECD metric um, that OECD, the rich man's club, right, from Paris, uh, they define a healthy labor force as having a high level of the labor force have been to high school or above. And the reason they say that is because if you've been to high school, you've learned math and science and computers and uh, um, critical thinking and uh, et cetera, right? And you have language skills. And so you're, you, you also gives you that it's a level that you can start to learn how to learn as your jobs change you can adapt, okay? And so, uh, and you can see here, OECD countries, about seven or eight, seven or eight out of 10 people in the labor force um, uh, have been to high school or above, okay? Uh, you know, we do need a small segment of our labor force that's less educated. You know, they can do the landscaping, the nannies, the, the you know, work in the very low level um, service sector. Um, but but most people need to have a high income. I have a high level of education. Look at the middle income grads. So this is this is the South Koreas, the Irelands, the, the Taiwans. Is at the time they were middle. In, they were still middle income. Remember two dollars a day, and and the, the South Korean women are still they're still sewing, uh, you know, in textile sweatshops as we used to call them, right? But at that time, already. <laughs> Uh, seven out of 10 of the people in their economy and in, in their labor force, 18 to 64, okay? 75, 70 percent of them had already been to, to high school. okay? And there was a great video uh, done by a Korean um, uh, documentary maker in a, in a conference I went to. and she said, I'm going to show you two, I'm going to show you two video documentaries, the worst one I ever made which won the Pulitzer Prize of China, <laughs> I mean, of Korea, <laughs> okay? Uh, and two, one I just made recently. And she said, the worst one, I took a camera and I snuck inside a factory, a sweatshop, and the women in there, I, I have this, uh, these segments and I, and I have this narration that says, look at these poor women. They work 12 hours a day, seven days a week. And on after dinner time, after 6 p.m., then their bosses make them go to high school at night. Isn't that terrible? Okay. You know, so she's criticizing these uh, cabal bosses for making, getting, forcing their workers to go to high school. Then she says, that was 1978. So then she says, I went and followed up 25 years later 
and found these same young women who had been working on the factory floor. They were in white collar jobs as bookkeepers, accountants, uh, hotel managers. They had transferred to this high income, high skill economy. And, uh, and she, it was, that really made an impact on me uh, when I, when I saw that, that's when I started, you know, sort of looking, well, well, you know, what, what happened to all those other middle income countries? Well, look at them, the Turkeys, the Brazils, the Argentinas, Mexico, South Africa, look at that three or four out of 10 have a high school degree, six, I mean, six or seven, that have never been to one day of high school, right? And, um, uh, you know, uh, guess what? In the United States, in the United States, if you haven't been to high school, there's a five times higher probability that you're in jail, on drugs, uh, on welfare, unemployed, um, than having a middle-income life, okay? You don't want to be a high school, and this isn't even high school dropouts. This is not going to high school for one day, and and that this is a, a big part as these as these um, countries uh, you know try to rise, because when a country moves from middle income to higher income, wages rise fast. Well, that sounds like China from two thousand to the two thousand fifteen, right? And and work starts to change from low skill to high skill, and if a large share of the labor force can't participate. Uh, in that new economy, you start to get a polarization, right? Uh, high unemployment, rise of informality, then crime and unrest starts. And, you know, once you have crime and unrest, uh, nobody wants to invest in poor investment climate. You can't have, there's not enough qualified workers. There's sort of a stagnation and then a polarization that happens, okay? So um, uh, this is sort of what what we're you know I'm thinking about right as China is at this you know, sort of middle income. So what happens when a large share of your labor force sinks into the informal economy? You know, look at all these informal economies across uh, across these middle income countries from Argentina, Brazil, Indonesia. I mean, it's it's all fifty percent or sixty percent of their economies. Are, 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 are these, you know, gig economy workers, uh, workers that, you know, don't have benefits, don't have uh, set jobs, aren't covered by labor laws. Um, and, you know, they're, they're, they're on the streets, you know, making a living from a living from hand to mouth, and they, they in these slums, and there's crime. Uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, Santiago Levy, who used to, he was at, Chicago, at Harvard for a while. Uh, he's now at the Inter-American Development Bank. Um, he talks about Mexico and he's got a great talk on the Mexican paradise where he explains that, hey, Mexico had solid economic performance, export success, lots of physical capital. God, does that sound like China, <laughs> right? Uh, but very little growth once they hit upper middle income. He says, why? Well, productivity stagnated. And he says, in a big part, it's because their informal sector is too large, that, that it's this persistent informality that actually pulls down the, 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 um, uh, the formal sector and causes social problems, has resources diverted towards it, and leads to this stagnation. Um, um, remember, <laughs> uh, remember Mexico? Mexico is only... Three out of ten people have ever been to high school. Three or three or four out of ten. Um, uh, when when uh, there are so many people, you know, today that listen to this book and say, you know, why are you talking about this, Scott? You know, China's made they they've escaped the middle income trap. Xi Jinping already says the middle. You can't use the word middle income trap in inside China because they say well, she has already said we're out of the middle income trap. So, uh, but. Um, when I was in grad school in the late 1980s, Mexico was known as the next Taiwan. <laughs> they had grown, listen, they'd grown for two, maybe more than two decades at eight to 10% a year. Well, it sounds like China, right? And then all of a sudden they hit this peak as they're trying to move up the high income. And guess what? The, 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 the low wage, low jobs move out. Um, 
10, 20% of their economy, of their labor force becomes unemployed, about 10 million workers. And Mexico has this stagnation and they haven't grown since then. And there's been a rise of crime and et cetera, et cetera. You guys know the, 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 the point. So that's kind of what I'm, I'm thinking about is could this happen to China? Okay. So let, let's look at China now. Okay. In, in the, this context right here, clearly, clearly middle income, uh, upper middle income, right? But you remember on a per capita basis, this is per capita basis, there's still, there's 70 countries higher than them today, okay? But they're moving, we're moving up, right? And they, they, they've they gone a long ways in the past 60 years. They were almost poor in, in 1960, and now they're you know, um, um, hopefully uh, uh, gonna move into this high income category. So, what am I thinking about, right? Just to, to sort of repeat the argument above, while all kids don't need to go to college, not children. I mean, the entire, the labor force has to be highly educated because China's going to move up and these jobs are going to go away and, and they need to have, you know, uh, seven, six or 700 million workers in this high skill, high wage economy, okay? Gong tong fu yu, right? Common prosperity. Because it's at this critical stage of development when, when workers and the children get the skills they need. So where's China in this? Okay, not just children, the entire labor force. Okay, um, China actually has the lowest level of human capital in. It's actually the upper middle income world, but in the middle income world, they're number one, number one low. Okay. Um, and that's not my data. Remember, I collect a lot of data, but this is this little census that, you know, like they did a little survey of 1.4 billion people, <laughs> right? And and so look at the 50 years old. They ask them, well, how much education you had? None. I've been to primary school, not even graduated, but low, uh, this is junior high and here's high school and above, okay? So if we extract this part of the graph out, it's 30% in 2015. Yeah, it's a little bit higher now. It's probably 32% in, in this new census, okay? But, um, uh, um, you know, 30% and compare that to the rest of the world, right? Uh, China has, according to the OECD metric, has a poor educated country than South Africa, right? Oh, the Chinese just shudder at that. Then Mexico, Turkey, uh, et, et cetera, right? It's, it's um, oh, very, very, you know, low. And what this means, of course, is that 70% of those in labor force are high school dropouts. It's, it's actually, they've never been to high school, right? They, 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 they got junior high education, which means they're literate and numerate, right? And of course, in the Chinese system, they're disciplined. Uh, they're great workers <laughs> for on the factory floor. Okay. So, um, this part's not in my book because once I started giving this, you know, say, you know, especially on the China side, they say, come on, give me some evidence that this is going to be affecting China's kind. We don't see it, right? This is, you know, especially when they're growing at 10%, uh, 12% a year in 2013, 10% in 2015, uh-oh, 8% in 2017, uh-oh, 16%, 6% in, in 2019, right? Uh but they're saying, uh, where do we see the effect of this problem here? So I like to look at two key indicators. This is also government statistics, okay? Look at employment and wages, okay? And what you see here is 2004. So, you know, right after Zhu Rongji left office, one job about Hu Jintao are in, are, are in power then, um, almost, almost seven out of 10 of people in the formal labor force formal employment um, uh, labor force. So formal employment is, um, uh, has a done way. And employment here is manufacturing, construction and service sector. Okay, so it's even looks, it looks even differently with agriculture, but you know, today who, who's in the agriculture sector, right? Uh, old men, right? Uh, they're the ones farming now, right? And uh, middle-aged uh, women who are taking care of their kids. Uh, but so this is of all the people in the, in the um, secondary and tertiary sectors, okay? Uh, who have a formal employment share. Formal means I'm part of a done way. I'm part of a unit. I'm protected by 
um, labor laws. I'm well protected by labor laws. Uh, I have social services. I, I have uh, unemployment insurance. I have, um, you know, uh, I'm, I'm part of this unit, healthcare, et cetera. And, um, uh, and, and it was about almost seven out of 10. But look what's happened over the pre next 15 years. By 2017, by 2019, I just saw the updated data. It's almost reversed. And now it's six out of 10 people are in the informal economy. And look at these informal jobs. They're right, you know, it's going up at a rate. Formal jobs are actually falling now, okay? Um, and informal jobs, you mean, it's those, those guys in the service sector, right? The, the DD drivers, the, the, the Maytown delivery men and women, uh, you know, et cetera. The, the, what Lee Ke Chung calls, right, the Tan Fan Jin Ji, the, uh, the farmer's market economy. Those guys who go out and uh, sell their own goods that do their little repair shops and that kind of thing. And these jobs have risen at a much faster rate than, than these jobs, which are declining. Okay. And, and gosh, it, it, remember that, remember that graph we saw of all those middle income trapped countries where the informal sector um, is there. And so let's look at the different types of jobs. Well, it's because what's happening is here, down goes manufacturing. Construction jobs topped off in 2013. They're actually falling since then. Okay. And uh, now, hey, good news is <laughs> professors' jobs and doctors and lawyers and, and investment bankers, uh, those jobs are rising. Like Silicon Valley and, and uh, Boston is doing well and New York City is doing well, um, that, that those jobs are going up. But look at what's rising faster than anything. These are the informal labor intensive service sector jobs. Okay, and why are they raising so fast? Well, people that get laid off of here go up here. People that get laid can't find a job here go up there. All the new entrants get dumped into here, and it's going up at a higher and higher rate. So that's employment, and uh, you know, so you know, this is in Mexico. It's the tan fan jing ji, right? It's the the uh, the the farmers market economy, as Li Ke Chang said. There's 600 million people are living at 1,000 yuan per capita per month um, and uh, there. And, and look what's happening. L look what's happening with wages. This, these are, uh, that was the graph, is wages of the informal labor intensive sector is, are falling those growth rates. Um, formal, good news is, right, is we got to pay our Harvard, Stanford grads more and more every year when they go out into this professional sector. But the informal sector is, you see, really start to see the start of, of this polarization, exactly what happened in Mexico in the late 80s, early 90s, and then, right, and, um, and, and, and when it stagnated, it, you know, it, it, the, the country hasn't grown since. So why are wages falling in that sector? Well, we have this rising supply of informal workers, right? And, in employment in the other sectors, right? Manufacturing, construction, agriculture, it's all falling, okay? These laid off workers and new entrants only have one skill, the informal low skill service sector. So the supply of set workers into those sectors is greater than demand, right? Uh, the dual circulation economy is the one who's, uh, who's demanding those services, but that's still pretty low <laughs> given China's economy. And so if the supply is great in demand, those wages start to fall, okay? Um, so what's driving these trends and, and I'm, I'm getting, uh, 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 it's, uh, you know, automation, right? Wow, China is automating at an incredibly fast way. Globalization, right? Uh, if I was with you, I would step out from behind the podium and, and give you a spin of my jeans, right? <laughs> my Levi's. My, my Levi's five years ago were made in China. Today, Levi's are made in Bangladesh. Uh, I mean, sorry, in Ethiopia. 
um, uh, Samsung, you know, uh, this is still made in China, but it's not going to be made in China for long. Um, but Samsung already has stopped assembling uh, in China and et cetera, et cetera. So, so globalization is happening. Um, you know, Ch China is trying to keep their firms here by, by giving support for automation, right? We're going to automate, not let our firms move. Um, but both of them have the same impact on, on, um, um, on demand for labor. Of course, uh, the global recession and uh, COVID-19 has hurt it. Uh, will that be a, a short or long-term move? Should we expect more in the future? Well, you guys know, you know, China 2025, you, you can't say China 2025 anymore in, in China, China anymore because it's not a policy, right? But it is, you go look at the 14th five-year plan, tremendous investment into automation by the government. Uh, Hongbin Li, uh, my co-director of our Center Sky, uh, Stanford uh, Center on China's Economy and Institutions, okay? Um, uh, you know, he, he wrote this paper and he basically shows that China has adopted more robots in the past five years than huh, Germany, South Korea, Japan, North America combined. I mean, it is, it, it's rabid there. So we should probably expect more. And of course, Global supply chains are going to shift. It's hard, but but there is shifting going on. So should we expect more of this fall for the demand for labor intent for for manufacturing construction? Uh, a, a, a real supply shift over to these low skill informal economy jobs. Probably right. I would think that uh, that 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 could happen, right? Uh, of course, there's offsetting forces. If unskilled labor is fall, slow automation. You know, unless the government is investing in automation, not the firm, not the firms, right? Um, um, so uh, it's at this point of time that people ask me, and, and I'm going to do this real quick. I, I think probably most of the people here know, but. Does China know anything about this? <laughs> does Scott see this secret? But <laughs> but you know, does Xi Jinping not? <laughs> right? Uh, um, uh, and and what 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 I often say is, I think China is fully aware, you know, of it. Um, uh, there's been this huge rise of investment into high school, right? Um, uh, and that you know, there's been an investment into healthcare. There's been an investment in, and in, you know, whether they work or not is another. You know, is part of the book. I mean, their their investment in the high school has gone into vocational schools, and they don't work very well. But um, but at least they're trying, and they know that they need to have a better educated uh, overall workforce. Um, so I, I think that they do know that. Now that they get to the, the key questions, I'm gonna show you that in a second. Uh, China's pushing all these new policies, right? Dual circulation economy. They're trying to raise demand, right? If, if demand is high for services, uh, hey, people can get go, go into the gig economy and get higher and higher wages, <laughs> right? But if demand is low, right? And exports fall or top off, um, and uh, um, in demand is low if there's lots of uncertainty in China. There's not very well good social security. Um, people aren't going to consume services. They're going to save, right? Uh, urbanization of fourth and fifth tier cities, right? They're trying to promote, trying to create growth. Yeah, but when poor people, it's going to be, there's no poor people in China, right? <laughs> Can't say poverty, uh, but there's lots of low income people. Um, and uh, uh, if you read Terry Sickler, Lee Sure Gustafson's new book uh, on middle income, they talk about the rise of the middle income. Well, it's all the way to 400 million people on, already. Hey, uh, there's 50 million high income people. But remember, that leaves, you know, 950 million low income people and low income people they're the ones that are going to be urbanizing in these tier, tier four and five cities. They aren't going to consume services. Their income's too low. Right? Li Shi says, Li Keqiang said 600 million people have 1,000 yen per capita or less uh, a, a day um, per, per month. Uh, Li Shi says that, uh, hey, the number is, um, uh, it's 900 million live on 2,000 yen per capita uh, per month. Okay, so... Uh, when when you make two thousand yuan per capita per month for your family, you aren't <laughs> you aren't going to be ordering Meituan delivery every <laughs> you know uh, every night, right? Um, uh, so um, 
Um, yeah, and so you can see here, I'm not going to go through this, but you can see there's this rapid rise of uh, of school attainment. There was only, these are these are 15 to 17 year olds. And so in 2005, only 50% went by uh, 2015. It was already at um, um, almost 90%. 10 million new students were put into high school. Wow, yes. China sort of woke up and said, God, we need to send them. Uh, to there, but it's a problem of rural hukou, right? Uh, uh, the the participation rate of urban China is about ninety three percent. That's higher than Germany. Okay, so uh, of course, rural hukou people. There's seventy percent of kids have a rural hukou. So seventy percent of seventy, it's still half of. You know, there's a lot of people that aren't in. Um, uh, high school and that. So if they're going on a universalized high school, you got to get the rural kids in there, right? Uh, and it's a, it's a poor rural. When I say poor rural area, this isn't Gansu and Guizhou. Well, it is Gansu and Guizhou, but it's Henan, Hunan, Anhui, Jiangxi, right? This is central and western China. They look almost exactly alike when you look at schooling outcomes, okay? So here's China today, <laughs> okay? And here's South Korea and Taiwan in the 70s and 80s, okay, where everybody had been in high school, okay. Uh, and here's Mexico in the late 1980s, early 1990s. Uh, who does China look like? Uh, China, Mexico, China, Mexico. I mean, that's pretty, pretty stark, right? Uh, the, the, the comparison there. And of course, it's these people in Mexico that... Huh, some went to the U.S., right? But they went into the informal economies, right? Flipping tortillas and polishing shoes. You saw them there. And they went into organized crime. And they caught, Mexico was one of the safest countries of the world in the, in the early 1980s. And now it's one of the most violent countries. Um, and it had a lot to do, uh, you know, with this. So um, the challenge of the government today in China is to get st students and poor and high into high school and to provide training for laid off workers. Okay, so you know, you know, can can we send those thirty years olds that just got laid off their uh, they just got their job taken by a robot? Can we send? him or her back to high school. Uh, we need to do adult training. Uh, I'm not going to talk about that today. I can answer the questions, but uh, it's really, really hard to train someone, huh, um, a, a laid off worker in their, in their 30s when they have a family and they've never been to high school. <laughs> that is, they just don't have the skills to learn how to learn. Um, but even if we start <laughs> uh, uh, adult training programs and have put them all in the high school like China's doing, we have to make sure that they're ready to learn how to learn when they enter high school, okay? Um, and this is precisely the problem. Um, I, just, I, I, got, I, got, I got a couple more minutes. I'll be done in a couple minutes. I added these because Winnie, <laughs> Winnie is my, one of my, <laughs> she is my favorite public health uh, academic that works on, on China. And um, I didn't know if she had seen our, um, you know, our new work on babies. And uh, so I, I got these next four or five slides here. Um, and so the, the thing is, just remember our, what we want to do is make sure that students are ready to learn when they enter high school, okay? Um, why aren't they learning to learn? In the book, it's poor teachers are living in boarding schools, they're left behind kids, there's bullying, there's anxiety and depression, uh, they have um, uh, there's anemia and intestinal worms and, and myopia without glasses, okay? Um, but even if you do that, and we've done all these, we do these big randomized trials like, uh, you know, your J-PAL uh, people. We're, I, I, start, I mean, I love the J-PAL people, right? And two years ago, they got the Nobel Prize. Uh, and, uh, but, you know, they haven't done much of this in China. We've done this in China, big randomized trial. And it always increases learning of these kids a little bit, <laughs> okay? But you do them all together and there's still this huge gap because what we're finally discovering, you know, it's like it's taken economists a long time to, to learn that uh, early childhood development might be real, uh, ECD development problems might be a big problem. Um, so the last five or six years, 
I actually, we started in 2014 was our first uh, randomized trial with babies. Um, uh, we worked on this. Uh, actually, other groups are working on it in China now. We did a systematic review that was, it says forthcoming here, it was just published, <laughs> okay? So published in BMJ Global Health. Um, and we do three things in this. We look at development outcomes, 12 papers measure the cognitive development, the language skills, the social emotional skills of uh, children in rural China. And the, 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 the whole thing is rural China, not urban China. Ur urban Chinese kids are perfectly normal, like San Francisco or Sydney or, or Paris. Um, then they look at the sources of delays, and then we look at the solutions. And so the, we look, these are the delays we look at. There's 12 studies. 10 provinces, 18,000 observations. I mean, so here's where these 12 studies come from. Uh, all of them are after 2014, except for one. Uh, so this is very, very new. And they, we look, any study that has Bailey's, Denver, or ASQ, um, and look at these. So these are these 10 provinces. So, and it's not just Western China, Winnie. This is across rural China with uh, uh, central China heavily um, uh, representative. 45% of these children have cognitive delays. It's minus one standard deviation or below. Uh, so th this is what you would, so th they're, they're functional. They can work in factories, <laughs> okay? But they don't have the skills to really to do the high school math or the high school uh, language delay, social emotional delay. Sixty percent of kids have at least one delay, okay, in these in these studies. Um, and the source of them, you know, it's not genetics, <laughs> okay. Uh, the 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 source of these is, you know, eighty percent of families have never read one book to their young children. Um, eighty percent of them don't tell stories or interact with psychostimulation, 60% of them don't sing. Half of them have no interaction, sort of purposeful psychostimulating interaction with, with their, their families, right? So, um, so this high level of, co of uh, uh, poor cognitive development, cognitive delay, you know, is we think, and as you're going to see in a second, is related to this very poor uh, psychostimulation. And it's not that it's not that rural families don't love their kids. We in our surveys we ask them, "What's your educational aspiration for your baby?" Right, and 95 percent of of the families say. I want my baby to go to college. <laughs> okay. You remember 70% uh, uh, of them drop out before they went to high school, right? But they want their baby to go. Only 30% of, of kids in China, 35% of kids in China go to high, go to college, but everybody wants it. Uh, my favorite number is 17%. Do you know what 17% of moms said when these are rural moms said when they have their baby? I want my baby to get a PhD. <laughs> I, I just thought that's good. And, and I tell them, ma'am, no, don't get a PhD, right? MBA, okay, not a PhD. You'll be poor like us. Um, but so, so is it a problem? Well, the, the, the really remarkable thing is just in the last, you know, here's 2020, 2020. These are papers that are all just published in the last two years, uh, except for this one. Like I said, there's one paper that was done earlier. Um, is is there's been um, nine randomized control trials. They use different curriculum. They use uh, sometimes it's in home visiting. Sometimes it's um, uh, in a center. But it's all curriculum based, one on one training uh, with. Uh, the parents in teaching them how to stimulate their kids, to read to their kids, to tell stories, to interactively play, to sing to their kids. And, and I call this graph, all roads lead to Rome. There's, I mean, look at this. There's been t these t t 10 randomized controlled trials and every one of them has an impact. They've all raised the level of development of the kids uh, uh, in, in these, these programs. These are all zero to three kids. So parental training is needed. And the reason is a subset of them, see, this. It's why did they raise? So the, the, the mechanism analysis is because the, the parents are investing more in their kids' uh, time and, and money and their beliefs and knowledge about how to raise a kid. So it's really a fact that, you know, these rural, 
rural parents have a huge aspiration for their kids, but they just don't know how to do it, right? Um, and uh, so that's what we sort of find. And the last thing I want to show is, is it really, is this a really a problem in schools? So here, the kids are already in school, okay? There's no parental training, but we found, gave them a Ravens test, 41% of these 32,000 students that we, we looked at had uh, development levels minus one standard deviation or below. And look at this. So here's, here's their cognition scores and here's their math scores. So they were in elementary schools, third and fourth grade, and kids that have low level of cognitive development don't learn math, okay? <laughs> and um, in junior high, we went to Shanxi and Gansu, and this is Han area of Gansu. Uh, so these are all Han students, 100 rural junior highs. We measure with whisk or ravens, and you can see that, you know, um, uh, IQ or cognitive limit is less than 90, 66% in Gansu, 46% in Shanxi, half when you use ravens, just like in elementary school. Okay, and again, the same thing. It's, it's clear to me that it's not that these kids don't want to learn or their families don't want them to. It's that they can't learn. Right. And, and you know, look at their math scores and look at their it, it's huge, you know, uh, this correlation between them. So um, I'm going to finish up here. What can be done? Start now. <laughs> right. Uh, common prosperity. Yes. But, but common prosperity there's four policies with common prosperity and it's and it's um, uh, tax the big companies and have the rich people give philanthropy so they're going to take all the money away from the rich uh, but for the poor people it's don't tang biao tang ping, work harder <laughs> right that's that's one of the policies and the other policy is no welfare so i just don't get where common prosperity policies are going right uh um, I want them to take this money here and invest it into human capital, zero to 18, uh, uh, adult training. There's going to be some adults that are going to be able to learn, okay? And I think we need to take advantage of that. But, you know, it's not letting them get online and take an online course, right? And it's not just having them go on Sunday afternoon and learning. It's giving them one or two years of pay, okay, subsidize their training, have them go full time and learn a whole new set of skills that will, will give them sort of a, a, the ability to learn how to learn a new job. But certainly it should start with zero to three, four to six, uh, um, K, to, um, uh, K to 18, right? Um, so, um, you know, I, I, I think you know, is this Nong Chun Jenshin common prosperity? Is it really going to be taken taken uh, seriously by the government? Uh, is this urbanization component really going to matter? You know, are they really going to move 400 million people into 2,000 county seats? I mean, uh, <coughs> that's 2,000 counties times 200,000 people each. Is that how we're going to try to to run this economy? Um, so uh, I'm going to stop right there, uh, Winnie. And, uh, uh, it's just, yeah, uh, just about 45 minutes. I went a couple minutes over, sorry, but uh, that's okay. Perfect. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Scott, for synthesizing all the work that you have been doing in many years, but also some of the new work that is emerging. Um, it would seem to me that you are, you identify two major problem. One is getting rural students to go to school is one of them. And the second one is if they go to school, they're able to learn, which you identify as an earlier problem in cognitive development. On the first one, why do you think that, why do you think that rural kids are not going to high school? Because I mean, this policy of um, having children go to high school in a rural area is not new, it has been for a while. What do you see as some of the more fundamental problems? Do you think this will continue to increase enrollment or is there something more foundational that it will sort of stay at this 70% plateau and not going any further? And on your second one, which is being able to learn, um, which I find fascinating and is also um, seems to be grounded in a much more fundamental social 
issues. It could be um, structured. I mean, before we start, we talk about even in the urban areas, and there are many more children now living with single family. Before in a rural area, you have left behind children. Now parents are also separating. And so, 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 so can you just elaborate a little bit more on what could the China be, what could China be doing from a policy perspective for those both problems? And, and from a research perspective, what would be more helpful to get really down to the deeper issues that can unpack it? Yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, is that my next book assignment, uh, Winnie? Aspiration. <laughs> yeah, I know. I don't know. Uh, economists don't write many books, and I can understand why. That was uh, thank goodness I had Natalie. If you, if you, so, so Natalie's my co-author. It's really well written, everyone, because she did the writing. Uh, uh, um, uh, so, so about high school is, I mean, high school enrollment is going up and they're pushing people into high school. And, and I mean, as you saw, you right. I mean, families want their kids to go to high school. So why don't they go to high school? Right. Well, there's, there's two reasons. Um, uh, one, you know, one is um, I think families figure out that their kids don't know how to learn or can't learn, right? I mean, you know, oftentimes they get scolded, you know, you know, you're so lazy, you get such bad math scores, you know, I mean, um, and, you know, then they finally, they, families throw up their arms and say, you know, okay, go to work, you know, um, you know, you're not going to do, you don't do well in school, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So that when they get to that level, um, and one of the reasons is the way junior highs and elementary schools, junior highs work is since the early 2000s, they, they don't allow tracking, fast track, slow track. They, they don't allow. Now, cities have figured out ways around this, but in rural areas, you know, you know usually there's only one or two classes inside a, a rural junior high. So, you know, there's 70 kids in one class and 70 kids, in, and they don't, they basically randomly assign them. Uh, um, there's, again, sometimes in the city, in the urban the county seat high schools or junior highs, they'll, they'll, they'll have sort of fast track. But because of that, right, um, they teach to the top of the uh, of the track, right? Because and they and it goes really fast. Because you remember the rural kids in rural junior highs when they take the high school entrance exam, you know they're taking the exact same exam as everybody in the city. And so you know that that they this is a really fast competitive system. So if you're slow, <laughs> you just can't keep up, right? And 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 then the teacher then ignores those guys. And, and so, you know, why should I go to school? Okay. Now what China did is they said, okay, we need to get kids in high school. As you saw uh, that big gain, the 10 million new slots, almost all have come in vocational high school. Okay. And so, uh, so this is a supply side problem. So you said, why don't families send there? Because people see that the quality of those vocational ed schools are really, really poor. Now, I don't think there's anything wrong with vocational school. Um, uh, and, and the Chinese say, oh, but look at Germany does it. And, you know, Germany is doing better than the United States. But Germ what, what they don't get is that German vocational high schools are 80 percent math, science, language, cognitive, uh, uh, sorry, um, uh, cognitive skills, uh, essay writing, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and 20%, you know, learning carpentry or, um, uh, you know, fixing computers or whatever. Okay. And, um, and that China is exactly opposite. There's about this much math and science and this much <laughs> internships in factories and, you know, uh, taking apart motors and putting back, nobody has a compute internal combustion engines anymore, right? You need computers to fix the new car and they just don't get the skills and parents know that. Okay. So it's both, it's a supply problem. So I think that China needs to really improve on vocational education very, very much. Uh, and, um, uh, but I think, I think it's, 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 I don't mind them going that way as long as they improve it and put mostly. So number two is the babies. Um, it, it the bait. So I often say, uh, so, so we go and train mom in how to read and, and interact with her kid. 
and she's starting to read and interact with her kid, but there's so much financial pressure on family. She then gives the baby to grandma and she goes back to work and grandma can't read and can't write. Right. And, uh, um, you know, so this problem is a, is a big problem. And of course, moms, even educated and junior high educated moms have, um, uh, you know, don't know that they should do this. So I think if you go look at the rest of, uh, of the sort of middle income world, international, this inter-American development bank, about a third of their new loans are all on zero to three parental training in Brazil, in uh, Peru, in Colombia, in uh, Ecuador, uh, Mexico, uh, South Africa, and, and Turkey have put these in. China doesn't have one yet. Now, I want to say one of your colleagues in Shanghai Jiaoda School of Medicine, um, uh, Dr. Jiang Fan, uh, Jiang Fan, you probably know, uh, um, she's the director of the whole school. Um, she's been very, very um, uh, sort of involved in trying to get the, the, the health, National Health Commission, the, the Ministry of Health, um, and the Planning Commission to sort of raise this up. And they've just come out with new guidelines and new policies that say push. Um, and uh, our, our collaborators in China's CDC basically say uh, that finally there's this big discussion. And so they're telling them, hey, can you guys devise some programs that we can push out to these rural areas? So, so it's starting. But I think, the, I think we got to learn from Brazil you know, who's, who's gone through this so many times, um, Brazil actually pays their mom to go to these programs. And um, so it's, you know, and they don't pay them 3000 yen a month, right? They pay them a thousand yen a month, but they can stay home and raise their baby and learn psychostimulating activities and, and really develop their babies. And it's a very popular act, uh, program inside Brazil now for the, for the poor poorest of uh, 35% of the country. So, mm. so we got a lot of work to do in China. <laughs> yeah. So um, then we have a question, which is, um, you already answered one of the question, which is uh, why vocational schools fail, why they are not working well. There's another question is, um, how do you think of China's current, the double reduction policy? <laughs> do you think that this policy would help promote the rural education or vocational education? So, so this is to eliminate, uh, this is to eliminate cram schools? Yeah. Uh, yes. <laughs> oh, oh, oh boy. So, um, uh, in our new center, you know, we have six flagship initiatives, and one's in education and health. And uh, Sean Sylvia, who you know, uh, University of North Carolina, he and I, he, he does a lot of the health, and I do the education. Hongbin Lee does firms and productivity. Um, we also have a new, brand new program on demography, <laughs> and. Uh, uh, that, you know, and of course, <laughs> uh, you, you see the news out now, they're, gonna, they're counting the number of babies that are born in 2021. And it looks like there's only nine, what, 9.5 million babies born this year, and there's gonna be 10 million people die. Uh, so China's, China's overall demand looks like right. it's going to start falling this year, right? It was always 2020, 2028 when it was going to, but the, so, uh, so there's some people working with us that are that, they're really interested in it. one of the, one of the uh, issues we work on is how much it costs to raise a baby, uh, to raise a child from all the way up to the time that they graduate and they're on their own. Uh, in the United States, it's somewhere around three years of income. Uh, you know, we've got free public schools and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, uh, you know, there, there's a big variation, but it's about three to four years. In China, it's nine years. You need nine years of family income to raise one kid, <laughs> right? Uh, so if you have two kids, it takes, I don't know if there's economies of scale, but, uh, 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 you know, it takes 18 years. To, you have to work the whole time just to raise your kids. And I mean, this is a big, big commitment. That's why people are having me. So double reduction, let's get rid of cram schools and that will make it more easier for parents to raise their kids because the costs will go down. It's 3% of the cost of raising kids. Mm -hmm. So um, cram schools, are, I mean, that's a big amount, but you know, it's not gonna change the calculus families have. Uh, uh, what we see 
and and we're just basically doing phone interviews of of our families that that we were following before COVID, during COVID, and we were asking a whole bunch of questions about how they were dealing with things during COVID. But now it's post COVID, and we're asking about you know we knew if they were going to cram school over here before COVID, and no none of the rural people are getting any any uh, uh, tutoring now, um, and the r- urban kids. They're all bringing the tutor into their house, having one-on-one sessions. Uh, parents sometimes get a, you know, organize a little uh, uh, online session for their kids. So urban parents are figuring out a way around this, but the rural parents, you know, they don't have the resources, they don't have the, the know-how. So I think, you know, the cram schools had just got out to these fourth and fifth tier cities and they were cheaper, you know, 500 yen a month and, you know, a, 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 a session on Wednesday night and Saturday, you know, morning, that kind of thing. And, uh, um, you know, as families are willing to pay, but now it's gone. They're gone. So I, I don't think these double reduction is, that, that's not the problem. The problem is the competitiveness of the system and then the inability of kids to, you know, participate in, in this system. Just curious, do you want to comment a little bit on the quality of teaching and teacher as well? <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. Uh, so I'm not a big, as you can tell, I'm not a big fan of this urbanization into the county seats problem. I, you know, it's it's like I say, we want two thousand cities of two, yeah, two thousand cities or two thousand county seats uh, of two hundred thousand people. You know, Cincinnati is about 200,000 people. So it's like the policy is to set up 2,000 Cincinnati's across China. That's how we're going to urbanize. And if you know anything about Cincinnati today, they're struggling, right? Yeah, there's some people working here. There's a big unemployment and there's lots of people struggling in in the middle, right? Um, uh, Because there's just, there's no manufacturing, there's, there's no construction and services demand is low because people don't have money. And that's kind of what they're setting up there. But, okay, the one thing that might, this drawing families into these county seats really could help with teaching. Okay. Uh, at least in the short run. So in the short run, the provi- and of course, it's going to help with provision of health services too, right? Is now they're relying on the village doctors. And as you know, from Sean's work, you know, you don't want to go to a village doctor for, you know, tuberculosis or for angina or for childhood diarrhea, you know, because the probability of being hurt is higher than the probability of being helped by these these poor doctors. Um, But, you know, if they come into the the, if they living in the county seat, then you just go to the to the county hospital. Right. And and it's much, much higher quality service. That's going to be the same thing with schooling. okay? because people will, that people will be willing to be a teacher living in the county seat and, 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 you know, maybe commuting out to the suburbs of this new county, but, you know, coming back, to, it's not going to be that far, right? Um, that's the big problem today is you can't get good teachers to go out to these schools. I mean, it's a fundamental problem. Uh, and, 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 you know, if you, you know, China knows it's a problem and they, they can't even get, te- there's not enough teachers and then the teachers that are out there. So they started this, you probably know this normal education policy where if you come to a, to, to a school of education in each province, you know, they, every year there's, oh, I mean, uh, tens of thousands of kids that get free tuition, not only free tuition, you get a stipend to go to school, zeros. College is, it's, it's not as expensive as the US, but college isn't cheap in China, but it's zero if you, but you promise to go and teach for eight years in rural schools, that's the cost, right? Guess what? Nine and a half out of 10 students never go one year out to teach. They just say, they, they pay the loan back uh, or they just break their contract and it hasn't been enforced. Because no one wants to go out and live in a village and teach out there in the schools. I mean, you just can't get to teachers. And so, so then, of course, the policy is, well, let's spend money on retraining our teachers. Um, and my colleague here in the School of Education, Prashant Loyalka, ran two big randomized trials in Hunan with the Hunan provincial government, where, you know, we, we, we brought in 
uh, a, a thousand teachers and put them into the national training program and we left a thousand teachers out there you know all identical to start with and you know we, we measured kids learning before and after and then two a year later and basically these national training programs had zero zero impact on on teacher on on teacher teaching styles or what kids learn and the fact is is they probably they aren't motivated to learn and they maybe can't learn their levels of education are really low so teaching is a huge problem so that's what i'm saying if we bring these kids into the urban areas maybe that'll help um so uh, mm. there's other problems doing that but in the meantime it might be a it's 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 better than leaving them out in the in the rural areas right so just to say, uh, this is related to a question that my colleague Nara Dillon asked, um, but maybe um, at a broader perspective. Um, first of all, she wanna thank you for a very interesting talk, um, but she also asked, can you say a bit more about the urbanization policies, how it would interact with the rural problems that you have identified? Will urbanization of the in the fourth and fifth tier cities lead to better education, which you, you somewhat okay. alluded to just now? Um, and would there be additional interventions that are necessary? And what might be your thoughts on what kind of additional interventions? Um, yeah. Uh... Yeah, so I, I, I think I, uh, most, uh, you know, uh, uh, most of what I said, I think w was, was covered there. I mean, mm. I think that if we bring families into these fourth and fifth tier cities and give them really good social services, right? Uh, uh, you get better teachers, so you get better, uh, better education, you get better health. Uh, start, start these uh, uh, zero to three, you know, parental training programs. And it's going to be much easier to do them in the county seats than to do them village by village by village, right? So, so I think there, there, there are a lot of, uh, the, there are some good things. I would rather, you know, what, I was in a whole bunch of, uh, of um, uh, I guess it was a series of workshops through the early 2000s. Um, and uh, Vern Henderson from Brown is an economist from Brown that works on urbanization. That's his, his real thing. He had some Chinese students and they did a whole bunch of very interesting, you know, what, you know, what really should, what should have happened is, you know, Beijing should be, you know, 90 million people and Shanghai should be a hundred and a uh, hundred million people. You know, it should be, it should be like Tokyo to Kyoto to, you know, Osaka to Hiroshima should be from Shenyang to uh, Hangzhou, right? I mean, that, and it should be, you know, that, and that's what should have happened because you got such huge economies that come You know, China's not going to do that. Okay. <laughs> we know that. Uh, that's what I'd like to see. Because I'm, what I'm worried about is, the good news is we can give better health, education, early childhood development, uh, unemployment insurance, re adult retraining if families are in even small urban, urban areas, okay? So that's good. But the thing is, in the longer run, what are people going to do, right? Um, poor people, rich people are going to move out into the cities, right? And the poor people are going to stay there, and we're going to get this sort of um, uh, public <laughs> housing crisis in 2000. <laughs> So I think in the longer run, it's hard to say, but I think it's, I, we might as well take advantage of it. If they're going to do it, I think let's do it right. So. Um. Great. Um, I think a couple of questions is sort of along the line of, um, um, they're not quite convinced that a comparison of China to Mexico is uh, the, the right comparison. If you look at their growth trend, China has a more sustained growth trend. And, and do you think that is a fair comparison um, just by looking at the informal sector and the um, um, uh, and also the um, the education of the high school, or, or are there are there others that would make the two different? <clears throat> well, I mean, I, I got it. I mean, I, I I understand you know completely. I mean that China isn't Mexico, right? I mean, the, and and the two thousand twenties isn't the nineteen eighties, right? And so the world's changed a lot, right? And um, uh, 
uh, Mexico didn't have to deal with automation, right? So, so maybe, maybe China, maybe this isn't a fair comparison. Maybe the problem is going to be much worse for China, right? Um, and uh, but so, so I often, I, I, you know, I get that. Okay, um, what I'm trying to do is to say there's a potential big problem with your that your economy is facing, and and you know, and you know, people. I mean, they're sort of you know. It, you know, ignoring it, right? And it's, I mean, that's what I'm saying. Common prosperity doesn't have, uh, doesn't have big investment into education, rural education, rural health, early childhood development, Nong right? Rural vitalization, rural revitalization, whatever it's called in English. It doesn't have, it's, it's, it's the Ministry of Agriculture. Let's go, put, so I, I just, so this is what I tell people, okay? So um, maybe you don't think, that this problem of an undereducated workforce, you know, really is going to be, you know, a, a, a problem that pulls and holds China from developing. Okay, uh, I don't believe what Scott says. I, you know, maybe. Okay, so I was asking you, what's the probability that I'm right? <laughs> okay, and and you can be, you know, a big skeptic. Uh, I think you only have a five percent probability of right, or a ten percent probability of being right. Right? Um, then you know, uh, you know, I, I think that I think it's a little higher than that. Okay, but uh, and I think there's other problems out there in the economy that's going to hurt, like you know, their move to state-owned enterprises and planning and uh, uh, you know, trying to and to fourth and fifth-tier cities. Okay, I, just, I don't think those are drivers of economic growth. Okay, but and and but this this problem of human capital is what you know. Should we give it that much attention? And and I say, okay. Uh, you know, Winnie, do you drive? <laughs> do you drive Winnie? Yes. Do you have a car? Yes. Do you buy, do you buy insurance? Yes. What's the probability of you having an accident, right? Oh, you know, it's less than 10%. But so why did it's so low? Why do you buy insurance? Right? It's because it might happen. Well, that's what I say with this is this might be a big problem. So let's buy insurance. Okay. Um, and <laughs> I don't know about you, Winnie, but me, I hate paying my insurance policy, right? Because I'm giving it to some big company, right? That, that I, who knows what they do with that money, right? Um, uh, you know, and I've been giving it to them for 40 years. I've never had an accident, knock on wood, right? Uh, but I keep buying it. Well, our, to buy insurance for this problem, we have to invest in zero to three early childhood development and get our preschools better and get our vocational ed schools higher quality, right? And 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 pay our teachers more and da 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 over and over. Okay. And guess what? Even if it didn't keep China from growing, okay, yay, you're gonna give you're going to let them commonly prosper, right? So I think that's that's the answer, you know, to that. Um, and be careful about sustainable growth in China, right? <laughs> Look at since 2013. That's a, you know, very remarkable year, right? And it's 13%, 12%, 10%, 8%, 7%, 6%. You know, it's now down to 5%, right? And uh, um, so, uh, you know, and, and it's... <laughs> Countries not China's not going to grow <laughs> at five percent a year for the next fifteen years. It's not going to grow that fast. It's going to get down to two or three percent if they're successful. And um, what are all? And you see the, the the polarization happening. So okay, I'll I'll, right. I'll put it there. Right. I I I totally agree with people that I. But I, I want you to start thinking about that. That's why I use these analogies. Right. I have a last question. Is um. The graduates, um, the graduates that move from the middle to the higher income, oh, yes. um, besides the quantitative number that when they were in the middle income, they have a high percentage of people who have high school education. What else can China learn from that? to become graduates. Uh, they're, they're all market economies. They're all integrated into the world economy. You know, China has been in the past. Does dual circuit, do they want to separate themselves from the, from the rest of the, you know, can, can, can China, if China has an argument with the whole world, can they keep growing? Um, but I think it's mainly, yeah, it, it's, it's, it's really 
you know, um, can a planned economy with huge state intervention, can it continue to grow over time? And, and that's, that's the real problem. You remember, you remember going from poor to middle income, lot, lots of countries have done that. You know why? Because as you know, if you take your development economics class, when you're poor, there's four sources of growth right? And that's mobilizing inputs, right? Uh, bringing those farmers from the, from the, from, from the ur- rural areas to urban areas, bringing in foreign direct investment funding, right? New, new inputs, uh, marketizing, uh, getting rid of inefficiencies, right? So household responsibility system, uh, privatizing small enterprises, right? Those are everything that China grew on, right? And productivity growth. Right. So productivity goes from investing in new technologies and from getting rid of bad firms. And, you know, so if your growth is minus two percent a year, let them go bankrupt. If the growth is five percent a year, let all the money come to that. So there's so much investment in it that it goes down to two percent. And guess what? You know, modern economies like ours, 92 different industries have to grow at two percent a year, two percent, two percent, two percent for a hundred years, it just, it, and it's from new technology and productivity growth. Um, can a state owned, state controlled government planning system go through 92 different industries and get 2% a year? Okay, that's gonna be China's. And guess what? No other country has ever done it, okay? So no other country has done this with such a, a, a weak, educated a labor force and no country has ever done that when they're planned. Okay. And I, so it's a double, double whammy. And um, that's why I think that, um, you know, uh, you know, I I don't know anything about technological (laughs) investment, but I know a little about rural babies and that's why I work on them. Great. Wonderful. So um, what you have left as the wisdom of what you just said uh, would be great agenda for the seminar for the next term to look for um, uh, a presentation and discussion on can a planned economy continue to transition from the middle to the to the high income and the work that you continue to use it sustained. And um, so thank you very much. And uh, all of us at this uh, high um, education institution appreciate the importance (laughs) of human capital, but we hope that it is actually available and equal for everyone, those living in rural areas coming from a more disadvantaged background. And um, if it is not for a country's growth for humanity reasons, all those are very important. So thank you very much. Scott, for sharing your four decades of work and I would say passion in this subject matter with us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Winnie. It's always, uh, I I really wish I was back at the Fairbank Center, but uh, yes, we'll, you, we'll we will soon. invite you back and, and we're gonna, I hope that we can you, interact. You come out and see together. us too. And your yes, colleagues. likewise. Okay. And Thank I will you say hi to Michael Solsi, your, your director. I, I actually saw, we were both in person at the University of Penn um, about three weeks ago. So uh, some places are having, are, we are bringing speakers in and you aren't, but uh, let's do it uh, soon. Okay. We'll do it soon. Okay. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you, you, everyone. Thank you, Scott. Great question. Thanks. Great Thank question. you so much. So Scott, really wonderful. Thank you. And, oh, Winnie, uh, it's great to. Um, uh, I, I know you've been interacting with Sean on. Yes, and we're and trying. Thank to... you for doing that. So it's uh, he's uh, um, he's just ready to go up for tenure soon. You know. Um, yes. Yes. Normally he has done such wonderful.